I'm going to turn it over to Kevin and we'll get started. Thanks, Mary. And, and um, as Mary talked about, you know, the, the dry conditions throughout the Northern Plains has been, you know, a big issue for most of our livestock producers in North Dakota. And, and it's, we don't, we, a lot of times we don't think about the horse owner and the circumstances that they also may deal with. And with most of our, our horse owners and managers is they do feed a lot of hay. And so I think when it comes to pasture management, we also got to think about hay management and what the outlook is in terms of hay production. Um, so you can lay in that hay early enough. And so this, this, this map was created last week and the, the new one should be coming out today or came out yesterday, but you can see all of North Dakota is in some type of a drought, but 85% of the state is in a D3 drought, which is probably the largest uh, we've ever seen at this time of the year for this time of a drought scenario. And 93% of us are in D2 drought. So uh, we're dry. We have to think about grass production, forage production. And of course it takes water to grow grass. And so let's talk about some options here, um, what, it, what you can do, what to think about to be prepared for if you're gonna be looking for short shortages. Um, I do wanna I put this slide up here because I think it's important to understand a lot of our hay grow, a lot of our horse owners um, do buy a lot of hay. And so if you're looking to buy hay, um, we'll talk about this later on, but you can see the whole Western half of the United States is in some type of a drought. And the North Dakota, you know, Eastern Montana, North Dakota is in a D3 area. So if you do look, need to look for hay, I would, I would probably recommend looking east and southeast. Um, we don't have much of a drought in Minnesota. Even in that Eastern part of South Dakota looks pretty good. And so those are probably gonna be your avenues to look for hay versus going west or southwest. And there's a little area there in South Central Montana that looks pretty good, but a lot of that hay will probably move into Montana or south. So, just something to think about in terms of uh, on, a, on a national scale, what the drought looks like in terms of the Western US. So when did the drought start? I mean, you know, I've been raising horses for 30 years. I, I noticed this last year on my pastures, uh, we just ran out of forage early um, because we started getting dry last year. So this drought really started in, in, in last spring of 2020. Um, what saved us last year was the, the wet fall in 2019 much of the state received 150 to 250 percent of above normal precip in the fall of 2019. That moisture saved us in 2020, which is why most of our hay growers produced a good hay crop last year. Most of our pastures looked pretty good, at least in the spring and summer. We might have saw some issues last fall, um, but, but that's kind of where it started, and, and we're really seeing this effect of the drought really happening from last fall. If you just look at Minot from September to April, they've received, this doesn't include May here, but this is September in, in April. They, put, they, had, they had less than one inch of, of moisture during that time period. That's 12% of normal. And they only had about two and a half inches of snow reported at the airport. So we didn't have much snow and we didn't have much moisture coming into this spring. And so you can see why this spring is looking to be dismal because we just didn't have much last fall as well or this winter. Now we talk about snow and, and when it comes to snow, the biggest benefit of snow is really recharge for water sources. And so if you rely on stock dams or water sources, um, make sure that they, they look good. Mo many of them are gonna be drawn down. And when they're drawn down, there's other issues that can occur. And, and I know Rachel's gonna cover the water uh, issues later on, but if it's something that you need to look at, do you have good water? Do you have reliable water? And if you don't need to think of some options or alternatives you're gonna look at because of watering these animals uh, this, this summer. So I think it's important to, to know, and that doesn't matter if you're a, a cattle producer, a horse producer, a sheep producer. On the Northern Plains, we grow our grass from the May and June precipitation. So if we're dry in that time period, we're gonna have a below average year for production. That's both hay and grass. Our second period is really that, that month of September, and that drives our, our vigor of our plants and the early growth that occurs in the months of April and May. And so I just, this is a graph of three different grasses. Uh, the blue dash line is Kentucky bluegrass. The red line is Western wheatgrass, and the dotted line is a warm season grass or blue, blue grandma in this case. And you can see, we grow most of our grass in that May, June period. Your cool seasons is going to be anywhere from 80 to 90% of its growth after that time period. And we almost always take off 
that first crop of grass hay uh, by the by late June, mid to late June. Our alfalfa's already got one crop off <clears throat> and getting close to a second crop by the early part of July. So you, you can really predict if you're gonna have a good grass year or not on precipitation in May and June. Today's May 12th. We've already got almost half the month of May gone. Some of us in the, in the western part of the state got fortunate moisture uh, last week, Saturday. The, the north central and the east did not get that moisture. But even though you got an inch of rain or an inch and a half of rain and be blessed you got it, it, it did a really small part in terms of, of really impacting in a positive way the drought. We need to really get five and six and seven inches of rain to really kind of make up for that loss. And so if the rain keeps coming, you know, we'll be in much better shape. If it doesn't, um, just know that that time period grows your grass. The second critical time period is the fall, really September, early October. That produces the leaf tissue that grows the following spring. So if you think about last fall, we did not have any moisture last fall. So our grasses came into the winter stressed. Uh, most of those pillars on our cool season grasses probably died. In fact, what I've noticed, when I've looked at my surveys, the majority of them have died. Uh, brome grass seems to have done, a little, done the best, I've noticed. Um, but that means you have a delay in growth in spring. And we'll talk about that as we go through this presentation. So we look at drought scenarios, and, and I know we had the fall drought, and we currently have a spring drought. And it's important to understand not all droughts are the same, and they all affect grass production and grass quality differently. And so if we look at a spring drought like we're, like we're currently in right now, spring precipitation has the greatest negative effect or lack of spring precipitation has the greatest negative effect on forage production. So we can predict by early June if we're going to have a good year or a bad year. The summer droughts like we saw last year, we saw really dry conditions by July and August. Um, that really affects forage quality. And so if you're grazing animals on pasture that looks like this picture here, where it's gotten fairly brown, especially if it's mature, uh, protein will be limited and energy is usually still fine, but usually protein, vitamins and minerals become deficient. So you need to think about how you're gonna feed those horses during that time period if you're lacking protein and more than likely you're, you're also gonna be lacking vitamins and minerals in their diet. And lastly, these fall droughts, like we also saw last year, um, has the greatest effect on plant vigor and next year's spring growth. So we already know because of what happened last fall, that growth this spring would have been delayed because we'd have lost that lead tiller that grew last fall. So I've been telling producers over the last few months, be prepared for a later turnout because forage production, or at least in terms of phenological production, will be delayed. The, the second caveat is we also don't have any rain. So it's not gonna be delayed. You're also gonna not have much biomass. So what happens if we don't get rain or we do get rain? What are the scenarios you can expect in terms of potential forage production? So we, our trend is looking for a below normal spring moisture. All the forecasts that I've seen show normal at best, below normal is probably gonna be more likely for this spring. And what you can expect in terms of forage production, whether you're on pasture or whether you're putting up hay. If we stay dry, expect a severe reduction in forage production, especially on those cool season grasses, which is brome, crested, bluegrass, timothy, orchard grass, as well as alfalfa in terms of your legumes. It looks to me like you're looking at about a 40 to 50% reduction in forage production for 2021. So, so can, you, can your, land your land manage those horses during that time period with that kind of lower production? If it cannot, then you need to think about alternatives to provide feed for those animals. We tell livestock producers you can call, you can, you can reduce your cattle numbers. That doesn't seem to be a positive output you know, in, the, in the equine industry. We tend to have our animals, we love our animals, and so we do whatever we can to feed them versus what we call culling like you'll see in cattle and sheep. So if we do get normal spring moisture, let's say it does continue to rain in the western part of the state, Devil's Lake, Minot area, western, even eastern, the Jamestown area gets some moisture coming up that continues through the month of June, um, you're going to still expect to see a loss of production because of what happened last fall. So based on the data that I've looked at, you can expect about a 20 to 25 percent loss of production. And in many cases, producers and, and horse growers can handle that level with feeding and different feed sources. 
if your pastures were overgrazed in 2020. And I hate to say it, but you know, a lot of our horse pastures are going to be grazed a little harder than we like to see. You can expect even greater production losses, even with normal spring precip, if those pastures came into the winter stressed and came out this spring also stressed. So just think about what those numbers are going to look like. So if we do get a wet spring, let's say that the, the showers open up and we get really good moisture, um, you may then see normal forage production up to 150% of above normal precip. If we get above 150%, you will probably see more than normal production. The odds of that happening are less than 5% of the time. So in a 20 year period, that will only happen one time. That is the odds of getting that much precip. So if you're not, so don't bank on those numbers to be prepared for, for the worst. And if it comes along, then things will be happy for you. If pastures were grazed properly or understocked, we get good moisture. We tend to see those actually do very well with even slightly above the normal precip numbers. All right. So when we look at this spring, what we've been really talking a lot about is when should we turn horses out to pasture? Um, and like any other producer, no matter what you're raising, we like to turn out as early as we can um, just to get them on, on fresh green grass. So let's look at, at we're going to look at two different scenarios. We're going to look at phenology, which tells you the grasses can, can withstand grazing pressure, and then production. So in this picture here to my right is smooth brome grass. I took this picture on Tuesday or Monday this week, so two days ago, and it was at three and a half leaves. Um, which tells me that brome grass is phenologically ready to be grazed by horses. It's probably been ready for about the last week based on phenology. The caveat is it's only about four inches tall, maybe six inches if it wasn't overgrazed last year. So it doesn't carry a lot of biomass yet in the month of May. And so you may want to still delay turnout to get some more biomass so you don't graze in front of, in front of the grass growth. You want that grass to grow ahead of your grazing. So you always have production and grass growth in the month of July, August, September, and October. Um, so you want to try and delay that if you can get some more biomass. The middle picture is actually Kentucky Blues, which is common in a lot of our horse pastures. It's common in my horse pasture, as well as the brome. In this, in this picture, it's two and a half leaves. Uh, the bluegrass is getting really close to being phenologically ready. Uh, the caveat, it, it is really short. Um, even in our pastures, which were not overgrazed in this scenario, it was actually moderately grazed. It was only about two and a half to three inches tall. So we have a, a little bit to go to get some more biomass out there before I would turn horses out on those pastures. I'm going to show you two different slides here uh, to give you a feel for what I mean in terms of what happened last fall. Sorry, I have a delay in my slides here. So if we look at at this slide, this was taken in 2017. This is Western wheatgrass. Um, we typically graze native grasslands. So if you have native range, we shoot for three and a half leaves on our cool season grasses. In this picture, this is Western wheatgrass at three and a half leaves on May 9, 2017. The caveat was in the fall of 16, we had ample moisture. So we had good, healthy tillers. They survived the winter. We had, even though we, we were a little dry in 17, we still had good growth. It was about eight inches tall. We look at the very next year in 2018. Uh, this is this is the same area, and, and uh, my slides are kind of messing up. But there we go. So you can see this is taken about the same time. Actually, five days later, uh, we had a, a drought in 2017, in the fall. So you come in, our grass growth was delayed by, by almost two full leaves five days later. What that tells me was was the bottom tiller actually died over the winter. We had to start from scratch. So we're at one and a half leaves and we're only three and a half inches tall. This is what's going to happen in 2021. And this is what is currently happening in 2021 is delay in production. We're, we don't see as much delay phenologically because we were so warm in the month of May of, of March and the early part of April. So we did get a lot of growing degree days that kind of made up for it. But the production just isn't there in 2021. So what are some early grazing strategies? And so if you're, if you're a, grow, a horse producer and you have some pastures that are either crested wheatgrass or they're smooth brome grass or they're Kentucky bluegrass, bottom to your right is actually old Kentucky bluegrass. This is actually quite an ugly picture. This we can see in some of our pastures that don't get grazed at all. 
If you do want to graze Kentucky bluegrass, or it looks like this. The picture to your left is actually meadow brome grass. I took that picture yesterday. And so my brome grass was actually at about four and a half leaf stage. It was ready to be grazed. These are your best options. So if you do have crested wheatgrass, or you do have brome or bluegrass or meadow brome, um, they can be re actually ready to be turned out either now or in another week if you got the biomass to support it. Uh, my pasture, my grass, these are about 10 to 12 inches tall. And we've had two inches of rain though in the last three months, three weeks. So I have, we've had the moisture in the valley. Um, so just think about those opportunities in terms of what you could graze early. If you do have a brome grass field or you do have a crested field, um, if you want to extend the grazing on that field, you should either strip graze it or rotational graze it. I actually prefer rotational grazing because rotational grazing gives you more permit on the back side, makes the grass grow out before the horses get to it, and you get recovery from where the horse is actually grazed. All strip grazing is means is you move the fence away from your water source every five, seven days, and you strip the field to have access to the whole field at, at that given time in front of the fence. Um, so it's a great way to actually let your grasses grow to get a little more healthier. If you do get the moisture, you'll get some more growth on that. And when you get recovery on this, let's say you graze from, from early to mid-May to mid-June or, mid, or early June, you give it some rest and you do get rain at that time because they grazed it and you've, you've delayed the phenological maturation, it will grow. You will actually get really good regrowth from that moisture if you graze it in the particular stage. So it's a great way to not only extend your grazing, but actually produce more grazable feed for those horses to graze. In our studies, we've actually shown we can increase efficiency about four, by 40 to 50 percent, which means you can get 40 to 50 percent more grazing days by rotational grazing versus season long grazing. And uh, horses are probably the worst bunch because they're terrible spot grazers. And when they spot graze, they graze areas that are short, so vigors down, and then they don't graze other areas because once they head out, they don't like it. And so you really get back to grazing um, with, if you let them to graze the patch season long. When you do rotational graze or strip graze, you become, you, they become a little less selective and you get better distribution of their grazing, which then enhances regrowth potential for us, more grasses than less grasses. Hopefully that makes sense. If you overgraze the pasture in 2020, your goal is to try and not repeat overgrazing it for two years or more. Our grasses are really resilient in the Northern Plains. They can take a one year abuse and be just fine if you defer grazing the next spring. Give them some recovery so they can get the roots back healthy and they'll be fine. If you do have, if you're gonna graze this spring and you need to turn up the pasture early, start in the pasture that was properly grazed last fall because it'll be the most healthiest coming into this spring. So just think about trying to not graze a pasture more than one year in a row at a heavy use. Last week, Rachel talked about rotational grazing and I have a slide on it earlier. And I think it's a great opportunity for, for horse producers to look at ways to stretch the feed. I know when we look at with cattle producers, we've got many acres, it's easier to do this, but it's not that difficult to take even a five acre piece and split it into three pastures and rotate those horses through that pasture. I actually like four pastures a little better because it gives you a little bit more resiliency in your grazing pattern. Um, so this works well, no matter what the size of the pasture, no matter if it's horses or cattle or sheep, it's an opportunity to extend your grazing days by creating more regrowth. And so it also creates a healthy scenario. And so we can look at rotational grazing, even in the horse. Industry. Again, if you, if you have three or four pastures, you can actually then, then minimize your overgrazing. So you have to overgraze. You can pick one of those cells and graze it a little harder and give it time to recover the next year. And it will be just fine, especially crested wheatgrass and Kentucky bluegrass. They're very resilient to grazing pressure. Grown grass is not quite as resilient. So you need to give it a little more time to recover, but it's a, it's a way you can actually get by, graze one of them hard, get it recover and let it defer. If you do overgraze a pasture, you remember you're gonna impact intake by those horses. And you're going to see an impact on, on performance of those horses. So supplementing feed is going to be necessary to maintain body condition on your horses. And I know Paige is going to cover some of that as you go through the talks. 
So just think about that if you overgraze about the health of that animal when that occurs. So what are your best options when forage is limited? And last week we talked about this. And we're just gonna talk about this. Dry lot feeding is a great tool to use with horses. This is my dry lot that I have at home. Um, you can see it's an area that I have water. It's dry a lot. I hate I hay, feed hay there. And I can let my pastures recover or I can delay turnout with pasture feeding. So you're basically creating an area for sacrifice. When you do that, you're going to get weeds in your dry lot scenario. So think about weed control. What are the weeds? And know that, that you need to maintain that dry lot just like anything else so it's clean and safe. You, you, you want some growth on there. Because in this case, you can see I'm fairly dirt. Um, we're going to have some dust issues. So health issues could be a problem if we stay really dry on a true dry lot like you see in my scenario. I do control my weeds, but I do it mainly with mowing. I can keep a green lush area on those areas. So the green lush is weed, but it's still better than dirt in this scenario. And so the, your best option is going to look, if you are running out of feed, this is a, an area in my pastures. So my horses, like everybody else on horses, they love to pack graze and they pick the bluegrass slick pretty good. Um, and so your, your best option is to look at purchasing hay. And I'm going to tell you this now hay is not going to get cheaper. And if it stays dry, Hay will be hard to find. So don't wait till September to buy your hay. Look for it now. Purchase early, buy what you need. And it's going to get more expensive the longer you wait. And purchase what you need for your horses. If you have geldings versus lactating mares, you can select either a grass, a grass alfalfa mix, an alfalfa mix. Buy what you need so you're not overpaying on high quality feed that you may not need. If you need high quality feed, if you do have lactating, mares then you need to bring in high quality feeding and you're going to pay more for that as we get later into the season and so let's let's look at some up recommendations as we finish up here i'm going to go through these recommendations and a take home message so turn out pasture i think if your pastures are about eight to ten inches tall and you're at that three and a half or four leaves they're ready to be turned out and so the caveat is and i had this call yesterday from a gentleman from, from iowa he said, should I just delay my turnout? Let my grass get more, more cured out. And, and in the end, that's probably not also the best option because you're going to create a low quality feed that the horses aren't going to like as much. And you're going to get really bad spot grazing. So I would turn out when it's ready and, and just hopefully that if your grass are healthy, they'll take this moisture that we have and do well. So I think if you got the brome grasses and the crested, they're ready if you got, if you got the production healthy. Um, so I do like to look at crested through the Western Dakotas. Crested the great grass, and horses really do like crested in the month of May. Horses love the brome grasses. I actually prefer meadow brome over smooth brome, but if you have either one of them, horses like it, and it makes a nice <clears throat> uh, pasture, and it is ready. Like I said, most of ours look like to graze now. And if you do have these bluegrass areas, I think bluegrass should be rested yet or deferred for at least another week get some biomass on that grass. If you get some moisture, so those in the western part of the state, your bluegrass will probably pop this week with the moisture you had, and it should give you some pretty good production if it's raining. And so um, alternatives to turning out, of course, is feeding hay. So look at your feed supplies, purchase if you need to do more, and delay as best you can with what supplies you have. Um, if you're gonna have to overgraze, like I talked about, grab a pasture that was not overgrazed last fall, it'll be your safest pasture uh, for 2021. So, and again, minimize this repeated overgrazing. And with, and I see a lot of horse pastures that tend to get a little short, they get a little weedy, and we, we really could talk about uh, weed control issues as well. Um, but if you don't repeat this overgrazing over multiple years, your grasses will stay healthier and weeds should be less. So my last take home message, and, and I know most hay producers, I mean, most horse producers will feed hay don't wait to buy your hay. If you contract hay with a hay grower, contact them early, tell them what you need, lock in the quantity, lock in the price as best you can, because hay is going to probably more than double by the by the, by the late summer if it stays this dry. If you need alfalfa or grass, see what you need and purchase what you need. Um, if you're limited in hay, there are supplements that you can use to feed stuff. And Paige is going to cover this as we go through this, this PowerPoint. There are alternatives you can use to stretch your hay out as well. 
And from there, I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel and we'll talk about water quality during a drought scenario. I'm actually gonna turn over to Paige, who is going to talk about water quality and, and feed sources or feed, um, feed quality. Sorry, Paige, I touched it again. If you could mute me. All right, thank you, Rachel. So water quality is important any season, but even more important during a drought. So poor quality at best can lead to decreased water intake and at its worst, it can lead to illness problems and, and even ultimately end in death if we're not monitoring it. Kevin mentioned about the lack of snowfall or the lack of the snow melt to recharge some of our dugouts and surface water supplies. But even if your horse isn't drinking out of a dugout or a slough and has a tank that's being fed by well water or a groundwater supply, it's important to test those as well. Visually checking your water sources every day is, you know, just a general good practice to do, even more important in a drought. And then also testing frequently in drought years is also recommended, particularly when moving to a new pasture that hasn't been tested um, recently. So I wanna to touch on what we test for. So total dissolved solids often mentioned as TDS is one of them. Okay, so um, TDS is basically is a measure of salts and these levels for most livestock, we wanna keep under 5,000. Horses are uh, parts per million that is and horses are a little bit more tolerant to the point where we don't get too concerned until they get up to that 6,500 parts per million range or so. However, um, anytime that you're testing over 4,500, we recommend that you send a sample into a lab. Um, the TDS levels are pretty variable across the state and they really vary between water source, time of year, um, the kind of the climate or the weather in your area. You can have TDS levels really high in one dugout or pasture or well and a couple miles away um, be within a reasonable range. So you can't tell by visually looking at the water what the quality is or what the TDS levels are. So testing is always very important. And across the state this year, well, even last year, the last couple of years, NDSU extension agents are monitoring this. So if you have water samples um, that you want tested, get in touch with your county extension agent, uh, bring them a sample, and they have the ability to test. So uh, go on to the next slide and we'll talk about um, monitoring for TDS and what you need to do that. You can purchase these handheld TDS or EC meters yourself. They range anywhere from, you can get some pretty cheap ones uh, up to around $100 or so. Um, there's a variety of different kinds out there. Again, get in touch with your county agent and they can help you out with that. When you're testing with these handheld meters, again, if they're over 45, parts per million, 4,500 parts per million, we want to get another uh, lab analysis done, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, as a general rule, sulfates typically make up about 60% of the TDS, but that's not true in all places and situations. All right, let's go on to the next slide. The other thing that we want to monitor for is cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. This can produce toxins that are harmful not only to your horses, but other wildlife and humans and pets as well. So the growth of this bacteria is typically more common as the temperatures increase and our water temperatures increase in July and, and August, but it doesn't mean that we won't see it in late May or June as well. Blue-green algae typically and often, most often occurs in stagnant still water. So again, our ponds or dugouts um, without a lot of um, water movement or stream flow, but it doesn't mean again that it couldn't happen in a stream or a uh, river as well. Most common, well, I shouldn't even say most common, but a lot of times people associate that blue-green algae with like the bright teal scum that's on the surface of the water. In the first picture, you can kind of see it along the edge of the waterfront, that teal color on the surface. And then there's a little bit of cyanobacteria coloring around some of the rocks in that second picture on the right. Sometimes it's really, really obvious and other times it's a little spotty. And again, you can't tell just by looking all the time what it is. So we wanna consider sampling or should consider sampling if we suspect we have some cyanobacteria in our pastures. Even more important than sampling is if you think there's some algae there is to remove your horses before they drink that water. These um, blooms can occur very quickly. They can uh, be there one day or not be there one day and the next morning they're there and the next day they're there. So they can be hard to catch. Um, 
Signs of the poisoning from this can appear within a few minutes after drinking, up to a day or so, and some of those symptoms are pretty general. You know, weakness, staggering, muscle tremors, difficulty breathing, um, convulsions, and then ultimately it can result in death if they consume enough of it. So it's a pretty serious issue. Let's go on to the next slide and talk about how we're going to get these uh, waters tested. Many commercial laboratories, including the NDSU Vet Diagnostic Lab, can, can, can do testing for the things that we're talking about today. The cost at um, the NDSU lab is around $25 or so a sample. And when you submit samples, you want to make sure that you follow the sampling protocol. Um, I see that Mary's dropping some of the links into the chat on where to get that detailed information. It's also on the, the image here. Most of the TDA or the Analysis for livestock water samples and for your horses as well are going to include the TDS, total dissolved solids, pH, nitrates, and sulfates, and then the cyanobacteria is a separate test as well. And they have different testing protocols and ways to ship to the lab, so make sure that you're following those instructions for whatever that you're, you're testing for. Of course, your extension agent is always a good uh, resource for that as well. So first remember that annual testing is usually a good idea, and then particularly in years like Throughout, you may need to test more frequently throughout the season. I'm also going to touch just briefly on testing your hay. And we've covered this before in previous presentations, and those are recorded and documented. But we want to remind you that, you know, if you're going to be supplementing feed with hay or dry lotting, it's always a good idea to know what you're feeding, especially when it comes to wanting to stretch our feed resources. So, a quick few steps to sample your hay gather the materials that you need. Most county offices have a hay probe that you're able to check out. Grab a representative sample from your hay lot. So 10% um, or a minimum of, of 10 to 20 bales, whichever is, is more is a good idea. Uh, beg the sample, send it to a lab, get the equine analysis done. You'll get those results back and you'll know exactly what nutrients are present in that feed. Go on to the next slide, and we're going to talk just a little bit about how to stretch your hay resources. So what if it comes down to you can't find hay in your area this year? Um, shipping it in from other areas is either difficult to do or you're not able to find that either. Here are some options. So you can replace with a pelleted, cubed, or vacuum-packed forage that is available at most local feed stores. That's an option. You can replace with a complete feed and that's gonna be a feed that's gonna have a forage as well as a grain concentrate in it. You can supplement hay with a concentrated feed. So maybe you're able to feed a slightly less forage if you increase um, a, the amount of concentrated grain type feed that you're feeding. You can feed older hay to horses. So a lot of times horse people are known for wanting the highest quality possible. But if that's not an option this year and you're not able to find 2021 hay, you might be able to get access to hay that was put up in 2020 or 2019. But again, test that older hay so you know exactly what's in there. Typically, there's going to be a little bit more waste in older hay. The outer uh, parts of those bales, depending upon how it's stored, is going to have some um, higher levels of mold or dust in it, typically. Um, likely those older hays are going to be deficient in uh, vitamins, particularly vitamin A. Another option you have is to feed lower quality hay in a free choice, free choice form so that you're sure that your horses are getting enough intake and enough roughage, um, enough in their digestive system to keep them busy and happy throughout the day. But then maybe you're feeding a small amount of a higher quality hay. So an alfalfa or a good grass hay that provides more nutrition. That's an option as well. Um, reducing waste in drought years. I mean, it's always a good idea to reduce waste for your pocketbook, but in drought years, if you're really limited on your hay supply, you might want to limit feed your horses rather than giving them as much as they want to eat. And a round mail feeder, maybe you want to use a net on your hay, again, to reduce that amount of waste. And Kevin already talked about really resisting that urge to turn horses out to pasture just because they've slightly greened up a little bit or they're starting to sort of grow. If your horses get ahead of that grass, um, we've already talked about just the detrimental issues that happen from that. All right, thank you very much. Rachel is now gonna talk about dry lotting. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I know a lot of people are preparing um, 
some dry lot areas in their own in their own pens to make sure that any pasture that they have that's either been overgrazed or maybe isn't ready quite yet for turnout. Um, you know, they're looking at at managing the dry lot that they have or possibly putting one in. Uh, we, myself included, are, I'm actually looking at putting in a dry lot uh, so that any of the pastures that I have can be saved or at least um, given time to recover because they were overgrazed last year. And that's one thing that I really want to make sure that I have in the future. So this is one thing that I'm using to protect those grasses now. Um, so when I talk about managing a dry lot, um, you might hear it called either a dry lot or a sacrifice pen or maybe an exercise paddock. Um, a lot of planning goes into these. So if you're actually using this as part of a rotational grazing system, um, you know, finding space off of a current rotational grazing pasture or um, working to put in maybe some cross fencing in your pasture to get a rotational grazing system set up, you know, finding space in that pasture to create um, a dry lot pen might be in your best interest. So these are just kind of some, some things to look at, some things to do prior to getting that pen set up. Um, you know, ideally we want them attached to adjoining pastures or a rotational grazing system, but that's not necessarily something that everybody can do. Um, maybe you have a space elsewhere that you can do a dry lot system into, but at least you have a, a place to start. Um, make sure if you're setting up these pens that you have you can do access with equipment to either clean out the pen or bring in a bale or anything that may may help you kind of manage that dry lot pen um also consider walkthrough gates when you're looking at something make sure it's something that maybe a wheelbarrow can get through so that you can manage the manure in there as well and then make sure that pen is also properly drained we don't think about it this this time of year, this year, um, because we're in a drought. But if if you're using that pen also for a really wet season, you want to make sure that it doesn't get too muddy. So what are we looking at when we look at dry lot pens? Um, so the needs in that pen are shelter, water, a space for feed, and then also space for those horses. So ideally, when you're looking at shelter, if you don't have, uh, you know, kind of windbreak set up or a space for a, a place for shade or that's shaded, you might be looking at a shelter that's three sided. And it depends uh, upon the size or how many shelters that you have in there depend on how many horses you will have in there. So if you have one to two horses, a 12 by 12 uh, three sided shelter is something that would be appropriate for that. And then if you get any more, you're gonna be looking at either a larger shelter or more shelters for those horses. So those are, that's one option. Um, making sure that you have space for both your water and your feed, um, and that there's good distance between them so that if it's, if it's during either a wet year, um, it's not mudded down too much, or in a dry year, you wanna make sure that there's uh, not a huge risk of erosion either. Um, and when they get too close together, you end up with a lot of traffic through those areas. And then when you're talking space for these horses, uh, for an average horse, which is about 1,100 pounds, you want around 400 to 500 square feet of space for each 1,100 pound horse. So if you have horses that are larger or horses that are smaller, you can adjust for those as well. Um, you know, it's all depending upon size. And this 400 to 500 square feet would not include your place for your water, your hay, or your shelter. That would be added on. So make sure that there's enough space for those horses in there as well. Um, and if, if you, especially you have horses that don't get along, you might be looking at more space as well so that horses are able to get away. Um, some of the things we want to look at are some of the benefits that we'll see uh, with our dry lotting as, as both Kevin and Paige have, have pointed out. Um, you know, it definitely gives your pasture some of that must, much needed rest. In a rotational grazing system, those, those pastures that they're coming off of, if, if we're in a regular 
um, season where we get enough rain, you're looking at possibly a two week rest on some of those pastures, depending upon how big and how many horses were in there. So much needed rest going into your next pasture rotation. Sometimes you have to wait a little bit. So putting them onto a dry lot is an option. Um, this also provides space during that, like I said, extreme wet or extreme dry conditions. It's really good to have dirt for that rotational grazing system so you can really get, you know, give those pastures a good rest and a heads up. Um, and then it also provides outdoor spaces for horses who might have some metabolic issues um, that can't go out on grass or, or have some other things going on. Um, and you don't want to turn them out into a larger pen or pasture. And as we're managing dry lots, we want to think about, like I said, space again, that 400 to 500 square feet. When it's too small, um, not enough space to move around and not really a good enough space for them to be in constantly. Um, but when it's too big, it gets actually harder to manage. Um, Kevin had mentioned about weed control, you know, needing to use a little bit of weed control in there. Uh, when it gets too large, it's going to be a lot harder to do to do that. Um, but also keeping a good balance for the horses that you have. So it's it's something that you might have to get into and try and see how well it works for you. Um, but at least keeping that four to five hundred square feet per each horse that are in, is in there. And then when you're looking at a dry lot situation, you wanna have a good fence for those horses. So permanent fencing situation or maybe some um, good heavy duty panels are what you might be looking at um, for a temporary space, but you wanna have something that's good and heavy duty so that your horse just can't push it around or um, that they can't get out of easily. I know a lot of horses, once they know green grass is growing, they want to get out of that pasture and get to where the green grass is because, you know, grass is always better on the other side of the fence. But we want to make sure that we have a good permanent fence for them so that it isn't an issue um, either pushing through or, you know, keeping them safe in that pen too so that they don't get hung up or, or injured because of it. Now, as we're looking at dry lots, uh, the ground you know, footing is, is a lot of, there's a lot of places we look at footing in the horse industry. You know, we want to make sure we have good footing in our, in our arenas, but the ground in your dry lot is also important too. So we want to remove manure regularly. This will also help with fly control. Um, Mary's going to talk about a little bit more of that manure management here in just a minute. I'm um, sometimes dragging that pen and you want to, this is going to be conditional, you know, how, when conditions are right, um, you can drag, drag that pen to, to maintain a level surface or to make sure that the drainage is there are correct so that you don't end up with uh, weird uneven footing. Um, and then when you're looking at high traffic areas, those areas around the gate, around where your feed source is, around where your water is, or sometimes even in those, those pens, you might want to look at uh, high traffic pads to control both mud and erosion, um, just to make sure that, that it's a high quality area for your horse, horses to be turned out in. Um, that also helps with if you have shod horses um, in mud situations, then you'll like less, be less likely to lose shoes or have any issues with that foot. And now we're going to turn it over to Mary, who will get us into the manure management consideration. Okay, so uh, we're going to um, just talk very briefly about manure management. And so um, <clears throat> when I say, yeah, okay. So when I say briefly, I just mean we are literally just gonna touch on these and then we can go into them more next week. Um, and I kind of, everybody that spoke today touched on a few of them already. And so um, we won't spend a lot of time here. So um, one of the first things when we have a manure stockpile, one of the first things I want us to consider is site selection. Um, more so from a aspect of uh, soil type. What do we have? Um, what kind of 
uh, soil do we have? And what are we, <coughs> whoopsie, oh, wrong way. Um, and what are we looking for as far as uh, leachates and how is that gonna potentially affect our surface and groundwater? Uh, manure collection. We do wanna collect, like Rachel said, we wanna collect that manure. Uh, we wanna decrease fly infestations um, and odor issues. Uh, and so are we putting the manure stockpile in an area where it's um, easy to access or we can easily get there, um, but it's out of the way. So we have less flies. It's not too close to our area. Um, <clears throat> and we have uh, reduced odors. So where is the manure storage area relative to the dry lot or the sacrifice area? And if you think long-term, how will you manage the manure storage area? So is it just gonna be um, constantly piled up? Are you gonna try to turn it every 10 to 14 days and, and kind of compost it? Um, do you just plan to put it in there for nine months and take it out then and spread it? So just some, just some questions. This week, I'm just asking you some questions and things to think about. <clears throat> Excuse me. So will you compost the manure? Will you spread it fresh? If you plan to spread it fresh, uh, will you do it or will you hire a custom applicator? And if you're gonna hire a custom applicator, um, do you have the land to spread it on? And is your manure storage area large enough for their equipment? Um, or can you move the manure to an area where they can actually get in and do their business? And so just all things to consider, again, just some questions for you to think about. In review of today, so will you monitor uh, your grass production throughout the season? What is your plan to supplement when you run out of pasture? Do you plan to test your water sources? Do you plan to purchase hay? Will you dry lot your horses? And what's your manure management plan? What does that look like? So like I said, next week, we'll go more into this um, as far as the manure management goes. But the rest of the things are just questions that we really want you to take home and, and ask yourself, uh, what am I doing right now? What's my plan? And how can I prepare for the future so that we don't run into a situation where Kevin suggested that if we get to September and we have no hay left and there's no hay to purchase um, or it's very expensive, um, what do we do then? Mm -hmm.